Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, most of you probably know I was on vacation last week, and we made some good memories when we were on vacation. Uh, my kids were excited to visit five new states that they'd never been to on our visit to the Northeast, and they also enjoyed Santa's Village, which is a, a, an amusement park, and we took a train, a train ride up uh, Mount Washington. However, another part of our trip was spending time with my Aunt Jan and Uncle Bobby at their hobby farm in scenic northeastern Pennsylvania, uh, dubbed Double T Farm. Now, not only were they uh, a convenient stop both on our way up to and back from New Hampshire, uh, but we got to meet their goats and their chickens, and we played on some of Uncle Bobby's, well, I didn't much, but they played on Uncle Bobby's machinery, and Jillian and I got to catch up with our, our, my Aunt Jan and Uncle Bobby for the first time in a couple years. I got to hear some stories uh, about my grandparents who died when I was pretty young as a kid. And I even heard a very an interesting story. Now, I'd heard it before, but I had forgotten about it. It's a story about my dad when he was in elementary school, and they took a bus ride to school, and one day, I guess it was on a dare or something, he ate a paper bag, and not just a part of it, he ate the whole paper bag on the way to school. Um, now our memories make up a big part of who we are, but a big part of our identity. Maybe the story of my dad eating a paper bag on a dare is why both my older brother and I, we've, we, we've won things like hot pepper contests or eating foods or non-foods on a dare. Uh, maybe we thought if subconsciously, if our dad can eat a whole paper bag, well, then we can eat a couple hot peppers. I don't know. Uh, but, but seriously, what we remember does, right? It, it can and often does play a big role in, in our decisions about our present. Paul uh, remembers, talks about remembering several times in his letter in the section of Ephesians that we read for today. Actually, Paul talks both about remembering and forgetting to the Ephesians. The church in Ephesus was not like the one in Jerusalem, which was primarily made up of Jewish converts to Christianity. It was probably, frankly, not like a lot of churches in America, where a lot of, a lot of similar uh, people, we, we tend to stick in, in our groups. But this was not really the case in the church in Ephesus. The church in Ephesus included both Jews and many Gentiles who used to worship at pagan altars and engaged in the typical culture, cultural and religious practices of their times, many of which were pretty heinous to worshipers of Yahweh. Um, they were two different kinds of people, two groups that in public typically avoided interacting with each other. In fact, they were somewhat hostile towards one another. Paul wants the church in Ephesus to remember that they used to be divided into Jews and Gentiles. The key phrase is, used to be divided into Jews and Gentiles. He wants them to remember that they had once been on opposite sides of the fence. He wants them to remember this is how things used to be, but Jesus had changed all that. Hostility, bitterness, enmity, rage, all those things had been crucified with the sinful flesh. He wants them to remember that this is how it used to be because he doesn't want them to revert to that way of thinking again. In some cases, when you remember things, you do so on purpose, not because the memories are great, but because you actually want to leave those, the, the, something in the past. When dealing with a, a major life change, that affects you know, attitudes and habits, sometimes you kind of have to remember old habits so that you don't fall back into them. You may be wary about a particular section of town or a store or a website that could lead you down a path somewhere that you don't want to go back to. It's essential to remember at times old and harmful thoughts or pa thought patterns or habits so you can avoid going down harmful paths in the future. 
And I think the more that we realize what Jesus has done for us, the more we begin to comprehend his, his grace, and it really sinks into our lives, the more and more our old, sinful, futile ways of living become obviously empty and unfulfilling to us. Now, we begin to see more clearly why it is that we value our Savior. The words that he says to us start to make more and more spent, sense as we aspire to live according to the values of God's kingdom. And maybe you've experienced some taste of that. If not, I'm convinced that you will if you continue to hold on to Jesus and to his words. Anyways, Paul doesn't want the Ephesians to get caught up in that old hostility and bitterness in the strife of their old allegiances and affiliations. He wants them to focus on Christ and on the new reality that can only be found in Christ. It's, um, it's a unity that transcends ethnicity, culture, and language. This unity depends upon a confession of our sins and a need for God's salvation. It also depends on a confession or an acknowledgement that Jesus is our Savior, that, that He is where we place our hopes and dreams. And only by finding, following Him can we find real salvation in a world filled with hostility and hopelessness. What sorts of allegiances or affiliations threaten our fellowship today? Now, there's any number of things that could cause rifts or threaten our fellowship, and you could probably think of them. Uh, where you grew up could be a problem possibility. Christians of different ethnicities or races could find themselves divided. Political affiliations, I mean, even things like sports teams or occupation or any number of things, uh, the list is pretty endless, could threaten to divide Christians. But the real question, the most important question is, what defines you above all else? Who are you first and foremost? Uh, what's most important to you and to your identity? At, at different points in our lives, it might have been any number of things, but now as Christians, we have a new, I, new primary identity. We are in Christ. I'm sure that, I'm sure that even in this room, we have plenty of different histories, different takes on what's going on in the world, but we can be united in our faith in Christ, in our baptism into God's people, we can be united in finding comfort and direction in the words of Jesus, and perhaps more importantly than just the words of Jesus, we can be united in the love and the sacrifice of Jesus, our Savior. So to get down to practically, how, now what, what do we do about all this? How can we, as we talk about remembering and forgetting, we have... Sometimes it's hard to decide what we should remember and what we should forget. And sometimes, on the other hand, when we know what we should do, we have a hard time doing it. What can we do? Um, and our goal, remember, first of all, is more than simply, it's not simply an intellectual matter, right? It's, it's a, our whole body. It's our whole life. Life's probably better than body, but body's included. How do we remember the right sorts of things and forget the sorts of things we need to leave behind? Um, well, the goal is, is, again, not just to remember, but to remember and to respond appropriately. We may very well know the facts, or we may know what we ought to do in our hearts of hearts, um, that there are certain things that we should avoid that are not good or not appropriate, but sometimes it's a little more difficult than just knowing it, right? For instance, I know that when I get frustrated, um, I sometimes respond in anger, which can be accompanied by yelling in some cases. In some cases, you know, yelling is appropriate, uh, probably a lot less than um, us yellers would like to think. But there are some cases in which it is appropriate uh, to raise your voice. Other times, I don't necessarily feel like I'm raising my voice, but people around me all think I am yelling, which probably means I am. Other times, I know that I'm yelling but I just want a situation to be fixed really quickly, and I don't want to be patient, so I yell. How can I remember that being out of control, that being 
hostile, as our Bible reading is talking about, uh, is part of my old sinful identity, something that I, I want to forget. And um, how can I leave that behind and remember that in Christ, I'm a new and different person? How can I exercise more, oh, went too fast, more self-control? Well, to be completely honest, I'm not 100% sure. Or at least I should say, at least I struggle with it at times. If I had it all figured out, I'd not still be struggling with it, but it is something that I know I need to continue to, to work on and something that I need to confess. What I do know 100% with 100% clarity is that I clearly need Jesus. I need Jesus for forgiveness, first and foremost. I need Jesus to be able to change my attitude because I can't do it only on my own. I need Jesus' help so that my friends, my family, and my church are not unduly hurt by my selfishness and short-sightedness. I don't know it all, but I do know that I need Jesus above all. Now, I don't know in many cases, or probably in any case, I don't know exactly the specifics of why you all need Jesus. I don't know all that you're struggling with, but I do know that you're a human being, loved and created by God, but also imperfect and struggling human being. I may, I may not know exactly why you need Jesus, but I know that you need Jesus just like me. And God does know. All those things I don't know, God does know. God knows you struggle. God even knows what you struggle with, and he still loves you. He forgives you, and he will lead you, he'll guide you, he'll challenge you, and he'll help you. And so that's why we turn ourselves over to him. We, that's why we throw ourselves at his feet in prayer, in confession. It's why we call upon his name for help and strength. And that's why we listen when he talks to us. And we listen especially to what he tells us when he tells us that our struggles don't define who we are. They're no longer our identity, even though we may sometimes feel tempted or even sometimes give in to them. Remember, that's not who you are. It's no longer your identity. That's who we used to be apart from Christ. But now, you and I, we are in Christ. And your identity in Christ supersedes everything else. Jesus defines you. He leads you and guides you. The Holy Spirit continues to mold and guide you as well. We are in Christ, and he is in us. And on the day of the resurrection of all flesh, Christ's work will be completed spectacularly. Until that day, uh, we continue to, to work together, to work through our differences and remember our identity and unity in faith. In Jesus' name, amen.